Welcome back for another episode of the Post Money Plan Podcast. My name is Dallas Post, and I am your host. As you know, I believe empowerment comes through knowledge, so my purpose here is to inform, educate, and stimulate thought within personal finance, economics, and investing. You can find me at postmoneyplan.com or search The Post Money Plan in the iTunes podcast app or in Google Play. All right, so continuing our discussion from last week on financial counseling, I'm talking again with Sarah Mizell, this time on financial planning. So before we were talking more about habits of spending and managing your money and things where you're in more often than not somewhat desperate financial situations or times where you don't feel like you have anything under control. This time in financial planning, addressing that, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the long term, making sure you have your finance ship sailing in the right direction Mm -hmm. and organizing things from a professional level of dealing with financial planners or other professionals to give you advice. So welcome back to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back. All right. So you gave us your background and experience last episode, but is there anything you can add in terms of the financial planning side and valued retirements? Absolutely. So I work for valued retirements. Our team has multiple CFPs, so certified financial planners. It's a designation that is a bit akin to a CPA, a large test education that goes along with that. And what that means is that we have worked to understand all of the different elements that can impact a person's finances and their whole financial well-being. That's everything from just general financial planning, which we'll talk about today, to taxes, to investing, to estate planning, Insurance is definitely a piece there. All of these different things in and of themselves could be standalone topics with plenty to learn. But as CFPs, we work to put all those together. I was just going to say, I think a big point there is that even if you start to harness a lot of the principles that you were talking about in the last episode, you know, having wise financial decision making in your spending and that kind of stuff, it's still an overwhelming amount of knowledge to know about everything from retirement planning to estate planning and all, all those different subjects. There's so much to know that it, it would be very hard to do everything completely on your own. Absolutely. And that's where seeking out advice from a third party that's a trusted third party is valuable. When it comes to financial planning, your goal ultimately is recognizing where you are today and then helping you create a roadmap, so to speak, to get you to where you want to be. What I said in the last episode is the first habit of wise financial management is just knowing what is important to you. That's just as true here. You have to know where you want to be. So in a financial plan, you need to do a status check, see where you are today, and think about what success means to you. Does it mean multi-million dollars saved for retirement? If that's it, and that could be the right thing, depending on your standard of living, what do you want retirement to look like? Do you want it to be retirement on a golf course? Do you want it to be retirement on a yacht? Maybe that's it. That's not necessarily the heart that we're going to be counseling you from. We're going to be counseling you from a place of impact and a place of what's more important from a relationship standpoint and what gives you a little bit more sense of value around personally, I think, is more of the way of saying that. We definitely work to help grow our clients' portfolios. That's our expertise. We're managing. They're trusting us with accounts that we are managing for them. But one of the worst things, in my personal opinion, is just to have my clients die with more. That's not the goal for us. The goal is for them to have resources and have developed interests and relationships that when they transition into a different phase of life, they really get to use those in the way that they value. Is it in Proverbs that it's a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children? You're correct. (laughs) And that may be the desire. It may be an inheritance. It may be outside of your family, building organizations or certain efforts. We're never going to tell you what it is or what it isn't (laughs) at Valued Retirements. That is for our clients to decide what they want to do with the money that's been entrusted to them. But we're here as just a counselor, just to help you kind of make out that roadmap The next step to financial planning is developing a plan. When you come to any good financial advisor, they should really walk through a couple steps with you. They should establish a relationship. 
They should gather a lot of information. So you'll feel like you're kind of burying it all. You should have to feel that way because to give good advice, it's important to know all the pieces. So there's a lot of data gathering that happens. There's a period of analyzing, kind of analyze all the data we gathered and help put together a plan and then present that plan back to a client and then decide with that client what implementation looks like. Is the goal to save more? Okay, how do we actually put that plan in place? How do you practically save more? Is it investing differently? We put that in place. Now you can do this without a team like valued retirements. So the same thing is you do all the analysis, you figure out where you want to be, and then you implement your plan. It's just nice sometimes to have someone with a different perspective to help you navigate these decisions. You implement the plan and then you monitor it. Nothing happens overnight. A plan means that you are standing in one place today looking forward with a strategy on how to get to point B. In life, not very many things are just that straightforward. So a plan, one of the benefits to it is it really allows you to be more flexible, to zig and zag as life throws some curveballs your way because you know where you are today, you know where you're trying to get It's a little bit easier, even if you get pushed off of that nice plan you drew out for yourself, it's easier for you to course correct. You're more likely to get to your end goal if you have a plan to get there than than not. I wish I had the statistic just in my pocket, but it has been shown that if you just write down your goal, literally just writing it down on a piece of paper, even if you don't keep it in front of you or regularly look at it, just the act of writing something down makes it more likely to accomplish. I can testify to that personally over the last year uh-huh. in, in many aspects of life. Just writing things down has made it so much more tangible yeah. for me. Yeah, it's an incredible thing. And another benefit that I just want to put out there when it comes to do I make a financial plan or not, a benefit is knowing that you are being purposeful. You're taking care of your resources, using your human capital, which might be your biggest asset right now, just your earning power, and you're using it purposefully. If it's a couple that we're talking to right now who's listening, it helps with alignment to make a financial plan. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that finances are one of the biggest areas of conflict in a marriage. So it's important with any advisor that you go to or consultant, counselor, whatever it is, to really have both team members on board. Usually they're going to be in different levels or different personalities or different comforts when it comes to money, but you can, over time, with patience, build an alignment when it comes to what kind of a financial plan you're putting in place. And planning will help you actually do that Mm -hmm. and and match your expectations instead of just all of a sudden having arguments or disagreeing with things and waking up like, whoa, we're on totally different pages. Instead of we've agreed on plans, Mm -hmm. we're trying to mutually come to the same destination. I can't even put it into words how much fun it can be to be on the same page as your spouse when it comes to finances or how devastating it can be to not be. I'm blessed to be on the first side. My husband and I have been married for eight years. We learned about finances together. We met in college. We learned about a lot of financial principles together. We've gotten to serve as financial consultants together. We have very different personalities in life and in money, but we are able to have the same heart And because of that heart and because we set goals together, we have goals for our family, what we want our family to be about, financial success in some ways follows that. Not that it's all rosy or that we just have tons of money, but we are able to make more purposeful, peaceful decisions. And when there's a question that our family faces, we're at least looking at it with a similar set of eyes and for sure a similar heart. So that's a huge benefit of planning is just putting that there. Now, what would you say maybe people should have saved for retirement by age 30? Do you have any kind of a guess on that? To have a middle income lifestyle? Yeah. If you were going to support yourself in retirement, maybe defined as age 65, as a general rule, and you will see lots of different variations of this, by age 30, you should potentially have one times your annual salary saved if you're on a path towards being able to retire and support yourself. By age 35, that should be double, twice your annual salary. If you're married, this would be both of your incomes, the whole household income. Age 40 would be three times. That number continues to stair step up. By age 50, 
a general rule would be having five times your annual salary all the way up to by age 65. A goal would be to have eight times your annual salary saved. Now, most Americans don't have that. So I'm saying these as just general checkpoints for you. If you're listening, check yourself on that. So age 35, two times your annual salary. Age 45, four times. Age 65, eight times. If you don't have that, a question is just, are you happy with what you're progressing towards or how you're living? And this is not because you have to have a certain number saved. It's just because we today have a different style of retirement than we had 30 years ago. There are not many companies with pensions in place where you retire and you're just taken care of. We have a very different system today. That system involves largely employers that offer a 401k or a 403b or an employer savings plan, and they put the onus on the employee. Not a bad thing unless the employee chooses not to be a part of that. There's all sorts of research about will people save more if you automatically enroll them or if they choose to enroll in their employee savings plan. I read this week that some research has shown that if you automatically enroll people in a savings plan, more people save. But if you don't, the people who do enroll on their own generally save more. So that's just kind of an interesting behavioral finance thing. But I'm putting all these numbers out there to say we live today in a society where savings is important if you don't want to run out of money. So just check yourself on those. To your point is just there's shifts that are taking place in American society Mm -hmm. so that the behaviors of, let's say, two generations ago aren't going to be the same behaviors that make sense for our generation or two generations to come. Absolutely. Because of things like pension plans and social security, Mm -hmm. where maybe you didn't need a ton of savings for retirement because you can depend on pension check and a social security check that are going to provide either a supplement or a bulk of the income that you need just to keep on living. Mm -hmm. But as those run out, as you're saying, Pension plans are almost non-existent at this point, and Social Security is even waning down where a portion of those benefits probably won't be available to people of our generation and generations to come. So that puts the onus on us Mm -hmm. to provide for ourselves. And in that sense, the targeting that you're saying shouldn't convict someone to say, oh, like I'm hopeless, I'm behind the curve kind of thing, but be more of a motivator to say hey, I want to make sure that I can provide for myself when I'm Mm -hmm. older, so I need to shift up and and get into higher gear and and start saving even more kind of thing. Absolutely. I love how you said all of that. If you're not saving 10%, that's a great place to start. Target 10%. If you can build that into your lifestyle. Of your income, you're saying? 10% of your gross income. If you can build that in, do it. And then forget you're making it. Make it automatic. Come out either before go into an employer plan and defer it before taxes, or when it goes into your bank account, transfer it automatically to a savings account. The best way to save money is to not see that you have it coming in. No question. If it hits your checking account, it's at pretty good risk of being spent. (laughs) Or maybe that's just my checking account. Building that in 10%. If you're in a phase of life where you're making more money and maybe you don't have as high of demands, maybe you're single and you don't have a family yet or whatever it might be, aim maybe for 20% and somewhere in that 10 to 20% is a really good way over time to build up that resource that you have or that savings and then invest it wisely. If you don't know what that means or what that even looks like, seek out advice. You can can do a lot with just those two principles and two habits. So we've talked now about a financial plan. Financial planning starts with a status check. Where am I? It's building a plan. That plan sometimes involves building a spending plan or a budget, kind of a month-to-month type thing. But really, a plan is more of a over time, you're looking at maybe years instead of months, what you might look like in terms of how much you plan to make or you think you'll make and what your expenses might be on an annual basis and then how much you can save. So you sort of get to see how your accounts or your portfolio would grow. Then you forecast. You forecast what kind of a growth might you get on that particular investment or portfolio. If you have no idea what's reasonable, that's where professionals like my team at Valued Retirements come in. 
We can help you understand what markets look like and what a diversified portfolio actually means. If you ever go to somebody and they're not talking about words that you understand, don't work with them. If you go to a professional and you ask them how they get paid, please always ask a professional how they get paid. In my opinion, it doesn't have to be a certain way. It doesn't have to be fee only. It doesn't have to be commission. It has to be some way that you understand as the consumer. Go seek advice from an investment professional. I personally think it's valuable to have a CFP or I wouldn't have gotten one, but I do think that CFPs give a different perspective. Know how they're getting paid and then make sure that they're interacting with you on a way that you understand. And those are some pretty good gut checks on whether you're working with a good professional to help you put a plan in place, forecast what that plan might look like, and work with you over time to make sure that that plan stays true to your reality. So if you talk to a financial planner and they tell you they're going to pull a Bernie Madoff on you. Well, if they tell you, (laughs) please, they might get points for honesty, I guess. (laughs) But take the stairs instead of the elevator, it might be faster. (laughs) The thing about the term financial planning or planner is that right now can get applied to people who do a lot of different things, whether they are selling a product or whether they represent basically any investment or product in the market and they're just helping you put what's best in place for you. There's always a conflict of interest in any business interaction. There really is. And that's an important thing to understand and try to identify. Mm -hmm. You always want to be looking out for where any conflicts of interest could exist. That's exactly right. So for instance, my team, we are fee-only financial planners. That means we manage a portfolio for you, say it's a million dollars. The fee that's due to us is a percentage of that. It starts out at 1% and then it goes down depending on how much you have with us. That means that amount, 1%, gets deducted from your account. That's how we get paid. So our interest is to increase your account balance. We want to grow your balance. There's also a conflict of interest for us. What if you want to pay off your house? We have to give you a piece of advice. It might be best for you. There's a conflict of interest under fee only. If we tell you not to pay off your house, well, we keep your money with us. But there's always something behind the scenes. You have to understand how we're getting paid. Now, if you ask us, what we'll do is we'll make sure and run the numbers and see what your mortgage is actually costing you and how much you're earning and how your portfolio is doing, what your goals are. That's what you should do to really be able to give a good piece of advice there. But But you still have to realize that there's a conflict of interest for us. So it's important, I think, for every consumer to really understand that it's everywhere. You have to really trust the advisor that you're working with and understand how they're getting paid. Just going back to the joke that we were making there about someone like Bernie Madoff running off with your money, transparency, I think, is is absolutely huge. Anyone that would be dealing with your money or handling your finances, the biggest thing, in my opinion, is that they're willing to be transparent with you. Absolutely. If they won't share things with you, then that's a red flag or Mm -hmm. something to be concerned about. Or if they answer you, but you're not really sure they used English or the (laughs) jargon is just so heavy. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. Sometimes I just talk about money a certain way and it's not a way that a general family talks about money and so it might not connect well. If you don't understand, at least maybe ask the question again, give that person a chance to re-articulate it or just try to connect a little bit better. If it doesn't work the second time, that might not be the right fit for you. I think that's a really important thing. If you work with somebody, you have to be able to communicate well with them, especially when it comes to money. So that's really what I would communicate when it comes to a financial plan. The last thing I would say, when you do a status check, early on in that element of financial planning, break savings into three categories. There's an emergency fund amount of savings that I think is a valuable piece to have when you're first building your portfolio, you're first building your savings. And that's putting aside anywhere from three to six months of your expenses. Have that available to you. Over time, as you have more money, you can invest that a little bit more aggressively if you decide. But early on, when that's all you have, I'd keep it in cash, CDs, or bonds. That's my preference, not the preference of everybody I've ever worked with. And then I would build purpose savings. So if you're trying to buy a new house or you're trying to buy a new car and you want a down payment or the full amount for those, purpose savings are amounts that you're trying to hit a target. And if you need that amount in a time frame shorter than 12 months, 
that also, in my opinion, should be pretty safely invested. Cash, bonds, CDs. If you don't need it for a certain amount of time, if it's maybe more of a five-year goal, that should be part of a diversified portfolio. And then there's your long-term savings, which would be your retirement savings or your college education savings. Those should remain as part of a diversified portfolio. That means part equities. For us, it's part domestic equities, part equities that are international, some bonds and fixed income, and then what we call focused investments or sectors that we think are doing well, technology, biotech, maybe commodities. Diversified just means your money is at work in several different areas of an economy. If you can have your savings broken up there, an emergency fund gives you a solid foundation. Purpose savings builds that habit of recognizing what you want and saving for it on the front end instead of simply going out and purchasing it, financing it, and by the time you pay it off, it's extremely outdated. And then long-term savings allows you to maintain financial flexibility and freedom long into the future. I think that's all I have. All right. Where can people go if they want to get more information on valued retirement? Absolutely. And then also just in terms of if that's not applicable for them, what are other ways that they can find financial planning resources? Absolutely. So valued retirements, we are located in Houston, Texas. We are at 610 and I-10. Our website is valuedretirements.com. My name is Sarah Mizell. You can find me at sarah at valuedretirements.com. It's my direct email. If you are not at a place where you want to find financial professionals, we serve higher net worth individuals. Generally, we manage portfolios for a single client. They usually have about 750000 or more to place under management with us. Or it's a higher earning individual, so they earn as a household over $100,000 a year. Those are kind of the two demographics that right now we work with at Valued Retirements. If you don't fit into that category, but you still would like to learn, there's a team of consultants at Houston's First Baptist Church, and you can connect with them by going to houstonsfirst.org, looking up ministries and finding finance. All the contact information is there, and that's a free resource to you, whether you go to Houston's First or not, but those are going to be pretty basic principles and advice pieces that are being handed out. That's not going to touch investments at all. In fact, we will specifically not give any investment advice through the counseling center, the consultants. All right. Thanks again for coming back on the show. I I appreciate it, Sarah. It's really a pleasure. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. All right. Bye. All right. That'll wrap things up for this episode. Thanks again for joining us. Don't forget, you can find me at postmoneyplan.com or search the Post Money Plan in the iTunes podcast app or in Google Play. Catch us next time on another episode of the Post Money Plan podcast.